Hey everybody, Dan Schieber here on Drum Talk TV with my guest, Ryan Titchy, who you may know not only from Drum Talk TV, of course, but he's played with Ozzy, he's played with Foreigner, he's played with Whitesnake, he's worked with Billy Idol, many others, Queens, right? And he and Joe Sutton are the ones that put together the fabulous Bonzo Bash events, and now there's something big happening for the very first time that Drum Talk TV is proud to be a part of. It's called The Ox and the Loon. Brian, welcome, man. <laughs> that was good. We that like worked out right. How you doing? <laughs> we never rehearsed that, by the way, folks. The only person I've interviewed in three completely different day parts, yet he's been at home each time. He's like one of the busiest guys in the music industry. And we're here to talk about, amongst a few other things, your great new event that you're putting together. And thank you for inviting Drum Talk TV to be part of it. Tell us all about this, man. Tell us about it. Yeah. Uh, okay. It's uh, it's it's called the the Ox and the Loon. So it's a celebration for uh, and to John Whistle and Keith Moon of The Who. So it was really like, to try and make it quick, because I know I can go off forever and stuff, <laughs> my partner Joe Sutton and I, back in 2010 when we did the first Bonzo Bash, which was called The Groove Remains the Same at the time, right. um, just in talking we were like, if we ever did this for another drummer, it would have to be Keith Moon. Like, we just said it, and like, oh, yeah, of course, we both agreed and moved on, right? Yeah. So that, that's, we're talking 2010. That's, it was, but we're working on the Bonzo Bash, the first one, but we're talking, you know, just like we talked back then, if we did it for a guitar player, Randy Rhodes, you know, we both just agreed. So they were always just kind of sitting there, you know. The, the House of Blues in, in West Hollywood, you know, um, had mentioned something to Joe, and it's probably something through our agent and Joe knowing people and blah, 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 and they go, hey, why don't you grab a night? Like, what are you going to do? Like, what? And he's like, well, if I'm going to take a night that's blues, I want to make it big. Brian, let's talk. I go, okay, let's talk. He, Joe is friends with um, Cy Langston. Cy uh, was with the Who since the beginning. You know, like, driving around the first tour in the U.S. He's like, wow. he was John Entwistle's like, best friend, <coughs> assistant, the whole thing. And Joe and Cy are, are buds. So somewhere with those guys being buds, there was talk about, you know, about how great John Entwistle is. He's a legend, et cetera. Joe was like, you're probably saying to Cy, man, that was so, you know, we both love the Who, Joe loves the Who, man, that was so, man, it'd be great to have a night for John. Well, he said it to me, and I was like, that makes sense, but for me personally, as much as I love Ed Whistle and, and the Who and Keith, to single out John, it, he didn't, he wasn't, I wasn't a bass player, I didn't grow up obsessed with bass players. I love McCartney and Geezer and Geddy Lee and Ed Whistle. And and you know, you, you, I mean I'm fully aware of bass players. I there's sure. I can go into great detail about why I love the ones I love. Right. But right. to tribute to one only and have a show, I I just don't know if I could get totally behind that. Like Getty, like a celebration for Getty Lee compared to Neil Peart in my book. Personally, it, it's just I'd have to, to go to Neil. Like I'm a, I grew up yeah, on Neil, yeah. like obsessed. Of course, so of I'm so I, I go I don't know. I go well you know we always talked about Moon. What about putting the you know the two together? And then we were like, wait, that's like a rhythm section. That's right, not right. just a that's a thing. It's an entity, and it's not just a rhythm section. It is the, you know, the pinnacle of rhythm sections. The most groundbreaking yeah, in the all. Most of and I think the most volatile rhythm section to ever bulldoze the earth. I mean, they were different. No one ever did that, ever. Even when when Keith was gone and Kenny stepped in, did a great job. Simon Phillips, great job. But that combination of the ox and the loon, there's never been anything like it. No, and it's the great thing about Keith, which I can go on forever about, which there's millions of great things about Keith, just millions, but the fact that, you know, we've all been in studio situations and you've got to play for the song, right? You've got right. to play for it. But who's to tell who what playing for the song is? Right, because thank you. I can go, well, are, do you mean Phil Rudd, uh, Mick Fleetwood, or Keith Moon, or Neil Peart, right. or Stuart right. Cole? Yeah, I would say that Neil played for the song in La Strangiato. He played for, the so for that song. Exactly, just like Keith played for the song in Going Mobile. But you... We'll never hear another drummer sit down behind a kit with a band and they present going mobile and the drummer does that. It just didn't right. happen yet. He, you hear his playing, you know, bubbling in the beginning and then it's just like, I, I don't know if it's because they tasted success. I don't know if, what it was or just they all got to know each other better after being a band that it just opened up and, and so the walls were torn down, the rules were broken and to this day, there's not been a band 
that you listen to a rhythm section year after year, album after album, and the tone of Ed Whistle to the fact that Moon's not even using a freaking hi hat live. You're, yeah. you're going. <laughs> I've been sitting here for decades, going, what? Why? Why did he choose that? The show was like when when I was like, whoa, okay, let's 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 tighten the show up a bit. Let's not go for. How many drummers can we stick in one night, dude? Squeeze them all in like we just did right, with right. Bonzo Bash, which there's reasons for that because there's so many people involved and you want to, sure, sure. you know, it's really hard to say, you can and you can't, you can you can't. It's like, all right, let's see how far we can go. But yeah. with this, I was like, let's give everybody two songs. But, you know, so like the drummer picks two, bass player picks two, da, 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 and we see who combines, like, which rhythm sections are created. That's cool. You know, which, which was interesting. Some people went, I'd like to use, you know, what about playing with this guy or this guy goes what about playing with this guy I do have two questions for you um, one of them is and and if you don't want to of course I totally respect if you don't want to say the songs but just answer the question but I'm just curious uh, well okay three questions so first how far back in the who catalog do you go and and are there like a couple or any really obscure what would be considered real obscure songs that aren't as mainstream and if you don't want to mention them that's okay but I'm just curious how wacky it gets if you will the, the, right now there's things that are going to change in, up into the you know probably to the rehearsals over the next week there'll be things changing but um, I can say this the most popular songs are being played um, there's a couple surprisingly that haven't been chosen I'm just like whoa like wow that one hasn't been Whoa, that one was, but that one was that's kind of crazy. Like, wow. Um, and uh, as far as spanning uh, Keith the Moon's catalog. time, yeah, the catalog, you know, with Keith. Uh, uh, yeah, we're we're pretty much we're com we're going from day one to uh, to the to uh, the to you know right up to the end. In the beginning. I went to London in 1964 with a ska group. We were promoting ska music. And then um, the manager of um, the High Numbers, he got booted out, Kit Lambert took over, and he came and he managed us. But he said, listen, that island stuff's not happening, you know? You have to go into soul, which is um, rock and blues. So we ended up supporting the Who at the market for, I think, a, a month or two months. So I saw them every night. And that's how I got to know Pete. and. Um, End up doing um, the Tommy song track and the solo stuff, and I think I did some of the um, the demos for maybe Who Are You or something. But you know, me and Pete have been really like that from the days six since the um, '65, and he still can't understand how I speak because I, <laughs> <laughs> I song I, I played for him at the Tech Award last year, and he said he said to me, Pete, what did you say? I said, Pete, go to go to Bricks and the Jamaican, and you mean a friend of Jamaican, he, then you'd understand. I always speak because, you know, of course, I'm from Jamaica. Play with Bob Marley and all those guys. Yeah. I ended up in London, and I just love the Who and Moon. And that's why I played with Brian. Brian is like, when I first saw him, I said, anytime I'm doing my gig, I lose it. If I can't get Brian, I call him murderation. Murderation meaning Jamaica. Somebody murder something, but in a good way, you know? Yes. And everything he does on the field, I can... I, I don't have to think about it. I just, whatever he does, I, f I play along with yeah, it. It's innate. It fits. He, yeah. He reminds me, um, he reminds me a lot of uh, Mooney. Stephen Perkins, how are you? I feel good. I just played drums. and You did? Sure did. It's like coming off an orgasm. I feel really nice and relaxed. It's a drumgasm. It was great. Uh, it's a wonderful gathering. You know, today and tomorrow's rehearsals, which to me is uh, the competitive spirit kicks in. Everyone's practicing next to each other. And you know, tomorrow and, and, you know, and then after that, you kind of deflate and you get ready for the gig. Are you excited about Thursday night, the show night? I really am. The, the best part of it, besides me playing, is watching everybody else play and seeing, you know, Aaron off backstage yeah, yeah. and Portnoy, you know. The community of it. Yeah, it's a great thing.
John Bonham and Keith Moon are probably my two favorite drummers. And I probably would have wanted to jam with Bonham and party with Keith Moon. <laughs> yeah. And I wouldn't be here right now if, <laughs> to I, tell had, about it, if yeah. I had that opportunity. <laughs> but uh, might not have even survived that jam. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Certainly not that not going out afterwards. Right. But um you know those those that decade of the seventies and the late sixties too, but the seventies you know, that was unchartered yeah. ground for to yeah. waters for culture, right. rock music. And there was so much more latitude by the record companies back then. It was a whole different business, whole different world. And those guys just did whatever they wanted to do. talking about this thunderous bass you mentioned it's a warwick buzzer designed by john entwistle that's right john entwistle designed this um every, uh, here's the thing okay so um when i was a little kid growing up everybody has their heroes right, right. and somewhere around 13 years old all the worlds collided i think um you had um chris squire and uh um john entwistle of course and people like stanley clark were coming up not too far after that so the bass was becoming this alive instrument mm -hmm. so I have to say that it's such an honor to be able to honor, you know, my favorite rhythm section because yeah. I was tuned into the Who Like There's No Tomorrow. They were my favorite band. Really? And oh, still are. Oh, yeah, right up and down. So anyway, getting to the bass now, um, when I was finally kind of older and wiser and all that stuff, I started realizing something was missing in my life. And that thing was on the back of a package of Roto Sound strings, and it was a picture of this bass with uh, John Entwistle playing it. And initially, I'll, I will tell you the truth. The reason I asked them to let me hold it for a while was because I thought it was the ugliest bass I'd ever seen. And the, <laughs> the body style? Yeah, absolutely. Well, take a look. And so um, the reason I wanted it was because my guitar, uh, my guitarist at the time had decided that because of bands like Guns N' Roses and stuff that we needed to play more traditional instruments. And I was playing some great instruments by the, by the company Warwick at the time, which I thought sounded spectacular. Mm -hmm. So I was slightly annoyed by it. So I called up the company. I said, you guys make that John Entwistle bass. And they say, which one? And I said, the, the ugly one that looks like a hacked up piece of wood. <laughs> and so I said, can you just get it to, like, let me borrow it for a weekend. I, you know, I just want to take it out of here. How long ago was this? Oh, this is quite some time. I think so we're talking. This wasn't Friday. 87, 88. Okay. <laughs> wow. So um, anyway, I had left the band before that had transpired. And like three months later, this thing shows up at my door in Brooklyn. <laughs> and a giant box and I pulled it out and I said oh my god it's even more garish than I thought <laughs> but nonetheless I, I strapped it on and I put it on like that and I thought wow that's kind of weird it feels good like why would this thing feel so inter interesting um, the neck is really thin easy to play it seems to fall where my hands are you know right. so I adopted it immediately and it actually became my favorite bass it I just felt it. natural it from the beginning amazing and actually I've had three others since then and none has quite felt like this one this is an early one really? it's kind of thin doesn't weigh too much what is the wood do you know um the width the wood oh the wood <laughs> <laughs> that's a personal question <laughs> this is this is a brano wood which is a nice it's a very bright sounding wood yeah. uh the, the neck actually goes through here and this oh, okay, ankle, yeah, so all kinds solid, of woods yeah. are, are inches seven Beautiful. laminates i mean for anybody who's into i mean you're into wood, uh, drum stuff so i mean yeah. wooden shells you know you pick right. the bingo for the attack and stuff like exactly. that this seems to have all those things that john entwistle wisely discovered would make his guitar sound as piano like as possible right so anyway i fell in love with this thing this um i used to use it with brian tishy on um the pride and glory uh, record and when we toured and all that and i, I mean this thing has been flung literally because i because of the who i used to literally sail it across the stage wow there's chunks missing up here this came off at one time we glued it back on <laughs> really yeah so anyway um i pulled it out of the cobwebs for this special event and i'm honored to be here and they're actually playing the song that i have to play with them right now okay so <laughs> <laughs> had you ever played any of that material with other musicians before? I haven't, actually. This would be my first time. That's cool. And it sounded great in the rehearsal. Thank you. Really cool. What do you think of that kit? It's a monster. It's definitely something I'm not used to. I never do the double bass drum thing. And the cymbals are kind of like up here. I really have to extend my arm. So, you know. The I, size I, of radar dishes. Yeah, yeah. So I feel like I just did, you know, like 100 push ups when I get off that kit. <laughs> That's how I feel right now. <laughs>
Let's get one of those right <laughs> there we go. There it is. <laughs> you know. Awesome. You know, you, you talked all about this kit before it existed in the last interview. Hi. Hi. How you doing? <laughs> I'm great, Brian. How are you? What's happening? You talked all about this kit before it existed. And it was one thing to picture it in my mind when you described it. And then to come here at rehearsal and see it and hear it. It's just amazing. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Talk, uh, talk a little bit about your impression after you put it together and you got the... The cosmetics on there, which of course make it sound better as well, right? Yeah. If it wasn't for the, uh, the you know, the, the artwork, it would sound terrible. <laughs> really, I mean, you know. No, no, it was, uh, it's a, a Natal kit, and it came unwrapped with, you know, it was uh, a different color, I forget, black ash or something. So now it's just a matter of us measuring and printing it out, and, and we made stickers. So we get all these stickers made up, right? And then <laughs> the kit comes. I took all the hardware off, and we had, you know, you, you have st stickers. So we take this first Tom, and me, me and my buddy Phil, we, we wrap it. But we're like, ooh, ooh, bubbles, bubbles, ooh, do it even, because, oh, you know, it's man. stickers. So, yeah. And then you peel back a couple inches, there's a bubble. People, It's really tedious, yeah. right? Especially because so, it's a curved surface. Yes. So that's not Yeah, it's, it's not something I'm really wanting to spend a lot of time doing, but you got to do it right. So we finish, we go, ah, it's good enough, nobody's going to notice. Great. Let's go to the next one. My other buddy shows up, and he's like, uh, he's like let me help you with this one. So we do this one. And we're all like, no, 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 hold it there. We pull, pull, and it's like just like a whole thing. It's a thing. So I'm looking. I go, but when we're and I take the tom, one of the other toms, and I just wrap, you know, I just have the reg, the next one ready to go. And I go, man, you just wrap it around. There it is. Look at it. it's so easy. And and they, one of the two, they both basically said, well, yeah, just wrap it around. Put a strip of tape on it and screw the hardware in. And I'm like, I don't know anything about wrapping drums. I've learned from one of, from one of our techs, Lee, that you know uh, Scott Rockefeller does rock and raps and stuff like right. that. And he, right. they, you know, I don't know anything about this stuff. But they you, basically, you don't stick it on. You wrap it and screw in the hardware. Oh. So we go do that. It's going to look fine. So the rest of the drums outside of these two are are so literally are, the hardware's holding the it hardware's on. The hardware's was holding oh, on. Oh wow! And a piece of duct tape. Like if you look really, like right here, exactly here. Now the other problem, if you look really closely, it's not a problem. I mean, the other thing was when they when they made this um. Like this, the, wrap. The, the wrap, yeah, it it it's, it shrunk a hair like by a half inch, so that's a half inch gap. Are you t anybody really gonna care and notice that stuff? No, nobody's yeah. gonna notice. But each one of these of the kick drums on the bottom have a piece of tape, and each tom has a little strip somewhere, you know. But really, you know, when you look at this kit, you don't notice that, you know. Right. So that's that. So, and then um, Keith used a five and a half snare, and I looked at my Natal snares. And I have some six and a halfs, so I found a couple five and a halfs, and this wasn't black but Keith's pretty much a black snare so I spray painted this black we have oh. our spare snare uh, over there that I sprayed it painted black and then we have another black six and a half but I wanted to stick with five and a half because that's what he used right and uh, <clears throat> here we have the contraption that keeps the uh, the um, hi-hat next to the pedal um, for for you know when you're using a hi-hat there's no hi-hat here now but some of the who songs some of the like let's say who are you is, is all tick, tick. now you could have an right. x-hat like he had uh, on in the video and stuff but you know, we're leaving these symbols pretty much where they are, which yeah. is kind of like, you know, Keith's thing is this mm -hmm. kind of setup. One's high and a couple a little lower on the sides. Uh, so we put the hi-hat in here when, for, for the guys who need or want a hi-hat in their songs. And it's that simple, you know? Yeah. Yep. And for and, those wondering. we are playing this. But, sorry, we are playing yeah. this. But generally, I don't remember Keith really playing this. He really had, like, sticks and a towel and stuff Beer, on this. Maybe. Yeah, stuff like that. And he, uh, <laughs> and he would, you know, or he'd have a couple, and he would do that snare popping thing. Yeah. He'd be, he'd, he'd. Pop, pop a stick and grab another one and pop it and grab another and back to playing. Like he would, you know, Skates just like, there. yeah, he had yeah. a little system worked out yeah. with this, which I didn't notice until doing more, uh, you know, um, video watching and stuff. Yeah, watching old videos and stuff. And I want to point out, Phil, if you could get the pedals, there are indeed two separate pedals, one for each drum here. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and all, all Natal hardware, all, all, like I said, Natal drums and stuff. The, uh, the kicks are t um, 22 by um, 16, or is it 18? Looks like 18. I, I think, think it's 18. Yeah. You, you know, they didn't have the by 14s. So I wasn't going to get all like, let's cut, you know, like custom this and that. Just, you know, these would be cool. So the by 18s, the 13s, Keith was 13 by 9, nice and shallow. These are by 11, so there's a couple inches higher. So if you notice, you, if we had by 9s, you know, 9, de a depth of 9 inches, these would be down even lower. You could even sit more on top of them, you know? So these are 13 by 11, this, and then it's three 16 by 16s. He had a six, two 16 by 16s and a 16 by 18. Um, 
but you know it was just easy to go yeah. 16 by 16. So that's that's that you know and and sitting high, which reminds me, I want to see these things new seats, so it's kind of getting a little. You, when as soon as you sit high, you you you're over the drums. You're you're kind of like. You're, you're not like playing, you're playing like over and through them. It's a different yeah. way. Like I, I sit kind of straight and, um, you know, like eat my legs. I mean, you'd be a few inches lower. Right. And it makes you play it kind of a certain way a little bit. This, yeah. this top of it. Just think about Keith. He's always sitting higher above everything. And, right. you know, it's very. Leading into it almost. Yeah. yeah. So the combination of sitting higher, bring the snare up. I got the snare high enough where it's over the kick drums even. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like literally o above the rims and stuff. And, and, um. So you get the kicks a little closer even, which means you can get the toms maybe a little bit closer. And then the next thing is um, coded ambassadors everywhere, except for Emperor on here, just because we'll, we'll go through it. We'll be changing em ambassadors every song or two. So right. just keep an, em an em Emperor on the snare. Um, but it's coded ambassadors top and bottom. And that's, um, and, and the fronts are, the fronts of the kick drums are uh, smooth ambassadors, so single ply and P power stroke, you know, P3s with, uh, you, you know, uh, the coding, you know, coded one. So um, I just, P P3s are generally like the go-to, you know, if you're putting a hole in the kick drum, I yeah. say, you know, pretty much P3 is the way to go. And, um, and, 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 and then the Simon, Simon Phillips, uh, Simon Phillips mu muting um, muffling method, which is, you know, you wrap a towel and like, yeah. you know, and duct tape it to the insides. Right. I only have the towels on the batter sides. <laughs> And, and and in the uh, the front, there's there's nothing muffling, but mm -hmm. we haven't had a problem. It's like no, and, something sounded great. Yeah. So if you move into the world world of tuning, I started like this. I go, okay, we wrap this drum. Let's tune this. Let's put the hardware back on. Let's tune this sucker. And I go, I know it's gotta be high. If you listen live, it leads that main tom. It's like very Max Roach almost. At Elvin. Yeah. It's hot. It's a high tuned. 13 by 9, I guess, but it's... It was like you were saying yesterday, everyone of that era was influenced by jazz guys, and that's how they knew how to tune drums. Yeah, they, they, I mean, were, think about it. Was anybody tuning, like, low? Was there any, like, of that that hard rock D2? Really, right. back it then, it, yeah, it re really, it didn't. A lot of things that, like, were kits like this existing, before this type of kit, you know, this this rap. Right. Was anybody doing those custom yeah. raps? I mean, there's probably somebody somewhere, I just don't know, but off the top of my head, the big drummers, you didn't have... Like somebody going, like this was probably really, yeah, like Way groundbreaking. Yeah, time. like people are like, yeah. whoa. Otherwise, it was sparkle or wood. Right, exactly. So, so you go to okay, it's gotta be tight. It's and if you hit this drum on its own in a room, you go, wow, dude, that's probably a little bit too tight. But it's not far away from Billy Cobham or or, or Simon true. Phillips. I mean, they, they, you know, but it is. It's so you got a thirteen by eleven, but it's tuned up closer to a ten. You know. <laughs> to me, that's like Max Roach when you, you yeah. hear him go. Uh, I forget exactly how to play it. Like a. Who knows. Whatever that, that bass, yeah. I forget which yeah. one that is, you know, but that's where, he, you know, Carmine told me, you know, that's, we call it the roach when you go, right. because that was like max, max yeah. roach pretty much. Yeah. That thing. So anyways, that's, that's Keith's the other way. started up there because I got three of them, so I got to go down, but I can't go, you know, too loose. So you got, then you go to the next one, and it's always, like, I remember as a kid reading, Keith Moon said, bottom head's tighter than top. So I always did that since you know high school. I always remembered. Well, it probably gets more ring and and, and punch. And you hear it in the Who's Next recordings and stuff. Was, his drums are really singing. They're really yeah. really musical. So got that. You just come down a little bit. It's kind of normal. It's like medium. And then so that's you know. It's basically it's a, like thirds apart, which is perfect. It's probably somewhere in there. Yeah, I, yeah, it's pretty close. Um, uh, I think these are a little closer in pitch, I think. But anyways, then you go to the 16, you do the same thing. Crank this guy up. Which, it's, you know, it's like, you know, bottom, you listen to Zeppelin, one that first floor tom is pretty cranked, you know? Yeah. So I don't mind bringing this tighter because these have been played all yesterday, and we're playing them a lot today. So you got... Yeah. Hey, I don't mind that right up there. You know? On their own, I, I don't know if I'd... But when you put it all... Then I went, I got one, two, three, you know, because you know, for obvious reasons. <laughs> and they're all the same size. <laughs> Wait, why is in this four? I don't know, because I, uh, this is my first floor, floor time. Number you know, one, yeah, sure. Floor, so you got floor time one, but over here it goes two, two and then three. You know, Somebody, well, why isn't this two? It's right next to it. Because <laughs> I'm going for tuning, right? I go, I want the deepest one down here. It's going to be used more. So I want the bottom to be over here. So I got. 
So it goes even, you know, you can and ask by so the time you get down. This one, yeah, I could kind of, now they brought him up, I'd probably bring him up a little bit to get him further away from the, um, the bottom. There you go. And it's the only drum kit we can actually tune a fish. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Comedy hour dish, you know. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, we got this now. Now, this is just this is a drum I've had for years. But if you've ever seen, just go to YouTube, uh, Keith Moon Goldfish, and watch. And we we don't have water in there now, and the guy, the goldfish aren't real. We definitely don't have time to deal with people going, you know, what it was. It, yeah, hey, I'm an animal lover. I don't, I, you know, what I'm saying. And so you, are we. So yeah. So we love so, goldfish and drums. A little bit of humor. Keith, Keith always had tons of humor going on. It's like whatever happens, you know, he's just always going for it. Zany. He's always going for yeah. it. Zany. Zany is the correct word. It's a good word. I haven't said zany in like... If, and me neither, but it comes to mind when you think... He's zany. Stuff, he's zany. Right? I would say wacky, but I like zany better. Yeah. He's a zany guy. It fits the era. So, so, um, so then the kick drums are tuned low. They're, those are just... You know, because you just can put a mic in and, and you know, it's mute muffled. And it's really... If you listen to Keith's kicks, there's not much going on. It's not like this, you know, the, the bonum big thing. You know, that, that was such a, yeah. a, 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 a prominent part of his sound. The cavern. Keith's, it's more just like, it's just underneath Keith yeah. in your know, time. It's almost like, you know, it's just... That whole thing. So you got, and I just try and tune them the same. And yeah. You know, so um, uh, so that's what you got. You just got, you know, no hi hat if the guys want it. And we got, and we got feisty giant beats, you know. And we, and he was Keith. I think it was two 18s and a 20. We got two 20s and a 24. Um, so they're a little bigger, but they, they, they are. I, I'm glad we're. We got the giant beats going because yeah. they're, they're not they're not too uh, pristine like a 2002 and a signature and all that stuff which I I love. It's just they're It'd be a too little, clean of a sound for this. I yeah, think. it's a little bit. You know, Keith, we, it, 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 the sound was a little more. I thought you know closer to the to, to the giant beats, which is. Yeah. So and that's you know it's a 24 inch. You know, you know so so. You know, I was watching, he's like, oh, he's got this lick. Uh. And I'm like, what is he doing? I don't know exactly, but it sounds like that. And right. I think he's, because he wasn't using a hi-hat, he worked up this little, it's all over Who's Next, it's all over Live at Leeds, it's just a lot of this four-stroke rough sounding. <laughs> you know, which I, I leave him, I am my left, which probably isn't, but it's because keeping time with your... Yeah. Throw your right in, just like you know. You know, so you put the, you know, like and, and triplet four, and triplet one. Or, you know, one, two, three, four. You can hear them all over the place. Yeah. So I, I don't know if that's exactly what it does, but you hear a lot of that. But yes, that's pretty much it. And there you go. We wrapped the kit up. And, and oh, and the rims. The rims were some uh, other color. So I painted, spray painted the, the rims, the hoops, Ooh. the hoops, uh, black. White. And then we took this white vinyl. No, I, oh, I spray painted them all black. black. And then I measured it a little bit and, and cut, like by hand with scissors, oh, wow. strips, long ass white strips. They don't even meet to the bottom. They're a little short, the longest I had. So it's like, ah, nobody can see it. So I did that. And that's an, something I noticed about this kit was really. Those, those white hoops yeah. really, black on the inside, white on the outside, really stood out. It added to the, yeah. the, the, the look of the kit. Yeah. It makes it look more correct, you know. That, Definitely. You know, to me. Very yeah. beautiful kit, beautiful sound. Beautiful yeah. Beautiful job on the replication. For those of you whining and complaining, oh, I should be premiere. Go to the Ox and Loon page on <coughs> Drum Talk TV. Watch my interview with Brian announcing this event. We talk all about the kit and the why. If you have your head together, it'll make perfect sense. We'll it, it, it's easy. You, you know, just you, you find find other stuff to, to busy your time up with because it really, <laughs> really, it's really not a big deal. Cool. cool. All right, we got rehearsal started. Yeah, let's watch some more rehearsal footage. Yeah. Check this out. Where does the Who fit in the spectrum of influence in your musical sensibility? Major bands that I was influenced by. I got to see them when I was like 12 years old. Oh, wow. And uh, my older sister took me to see them at Madison Square Garden. And I, I, it made a lasting impact on me. I just was like, I can do that. That's what I want to do. Right. And I told Roger that when I first met him 12, 13 years ago, you know. Oh, 
tell us your personal tie-in with John Entwistle and The Who and, and what it feels like to be involved with this. Obviously, you're familiar with the whole Bonzo Bash scene, but yeah. what do you think of this twist and how does it relate to you personally and uh, musically? Well, I love this twist because uh, I'm a huge fan of The Who and a huge, a huge fan of uh, John Entwistle's. And uh, that was nice and loud, huh? But uh, one of the first bands I ever got into, one of the first bass players I ever truly listened to. He plays lead bass. He's, uh, he's a monster, you know? So for me, it's uh, very close to home. <laughs> so I'll ask, I'll ask you the same question. What's it like being a part of a tribute to the, one of the absolute best rhythm sections on the planet, and how does the Who music tie into you personally for your musical background? Well, first of all, there was a girl named Beth Stinson that turned me on to Who's Next when I was 12 years old, and I almost got lucky, so that's very significant. But um, <laughs> beyond that, I, I think that, you know, there's like 10 bands from around this time that completely shaped what we do now, you know what I mean? And so any chance to pay tribute to that. As a matter of fact, probably for the next 30 years, I'm probably going to pay tribute to all this stuff instead of pretending that my stuff's great. <laughs> <laughs> Although I wasn't a huge fan growing up, what a lot of bands that I kind of found later on in life, you know, now I, I, I listen to them all the time. Yeah. And it's just it's such a huge influence of mine now. It's, right. He's great. He's amazing. Now you're rehearsing for this show, and, and you get to play a lot of songs, being one of the main guitar players. Right. Is there a favorite that you're really looking forward to Thursday night? Uh, probably the Punk and the Grandfather. Oh, cool. Yeah, because I didn't know about that song. And I'm like, I don't know this song, and I just listened to it. James Almenzo's playing it, yeah. and I, it was amazing. I, I'm like, oh, this is an awesome song. There's another song called Heaven and Hell, that uh, live at Leeds, they open up with it, and uh, Entwistle sings it. And it's it's an amazing song too. And I, I didn't know about that song until this show, so you know. I just tore it up on vocals. Uh, talk about it. How did you end up with those yeah, two bet. songs? Um, actually, Stephen called me up and asked me if I wanted to sing these two songs. And I Stephen said, Perkins. Uh huh. And I said, Well, let me play them and see if I can sing that high. And I played the song and I, I said, oh, I could do this. Yeah, and yeah. It, oh, but I didn't realize until I got here. It's 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 a really Roger Daltrey is a pretty powerful singer, yeah. and he sings still. He still and he sings really high, and he doesn't give you a break. And so I'm trying to do him. It's wearing me out, but it's going to be fun. Yeah, it was great. Lots of energy. I mean, to hear the first couple songs just pop out and to hear the kit and Robert Trujillo on bass and everything, just amazing. What was your first exposure to The Who? When was that? Uh, Don't say last week. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. <laughs> the Who, well, I've always been, uh, I've always known about The Who from the day, beginning. You know, I mean, I'm their age, so, I, I, you know, I'm a, they're, they're one of my peers. But uh, what really got me turned on was when I heard the live album at Leeds. Yes, when I heard the bass tone. And I went, what the hell is that? And between him and Chris Squire, yeah, I, went and, I, went and, I went and stole their tone. Yeah. And I'm still using The click, the hammer yeah. on the strings. But, yeah. I, I call it the rattle. You know, yeah. it's, just, it's, just, it's, it's a clang, you know, whatever you want to call it. But I love his tone. And so, yeah, when I was asked to do this, this is like really exciting. No get, brainer. Huh? No brainer. I get to play a song on a bass, too. Oh, great. What song? Um, uh, uh. I love the live version of that, especially with that extended jam. Yeah, I do too. about Peter and 
of course, who we're here to pay t- tribute to is John Entwistle and Keith Moon. But talk about the Who in general as well, and how, from a guitar player standpoint, you feel about that rhythm section that was John Entwistle and Keith Moon. Um, uh, well, they were great. <laughs> <laughs> that sums it up. Thanks for coming. Uh, I, I no. don't know. <laughs> no. um, uh, what can you say? What can you say? I mean, uh, Pete Townsend was. Uh, the, the the best rhythm guitar one of the best rhythm guitar players in rock ever and uh, and he wrote such amazing music and those guys were just uh, bombastic and crazy and awesome and uh, it's just uh, it's it's great to to be able to represent that music. How would you tell other guitar players how to emulate Pete's style? Like, are there any th- specific hmm. things to pay attention to? Uh, probably learn the banjo. Really? Uh, yeah, because uh, uh, I guess um, there was a, a traditional jazz player called Acker Bilk, and he played he played uh, uh, clarinet, uh-huh. and his banjo player apparently was a big influence on Townsend really? with the way he played uh, the way he played. Wow! Rhythm. There you go. So there you go. There's a little tip. <laughs> yeah, that's some great trivia <laughs> too. Go. That's cool. Oh, hey, hey, everybody, Dan Schindler here again on Drum Talk TV. You can come through, Brent. It's all right. <laughs> Brent Wood's walking through the room. And I'm here. It's sort of things happen by happenstance sometimes, including Belinda Carlisle. Exactly. I come here to drop off equipment. And, and get I, pulled I, onto I, our TV. Exactly. <laughs> Which so, is kind of funny. Belinda asks what's going on because there's all these rumblings going on beyond the wall. So I explain the ox and the loon. And she happens to mention, was it one of those things as soon as you said it, you went, oh, I shouldn't have said that to this guy. She had well, dinner with Keith it. Moon before. So I said, you got to come I on Drum I, Talk TV and I talk know. about it. I think I was 15 years old. It was at the Rainbow. And I like to think... Uh, I didn't go to college, but I went to the Rainbow for my education. There you go. Yeah. So. Um, By the way, you know, I want to mention that's why my mother, when I was a young teenager, she used to pay for my concert tickets, and she used to say, "I'm happy to do this because it's part of your education." I my know. mom got it. Yeah, I know. It's well, it was certainly mine, and and um, late '70s. Um, so before I moved, it was before I moved to Hollywood. So it was like 16 years old, 15, 16 years old, and a friend of mine. Um, I don't know how she met him. But she invited me to have dinner with both of them, and I had dinner at the Rainbow with him. And he was a gentleman. He was, he was, he wasn't, I mean, I knew, I had the reputation of being crazy and everything, but he was a total gentleman. What, uh, what did he eat? Do you remember? I know that's a geeky question, but I got to ask. For, it says about 30 something, uh, 30 something years ago. I don't really know, but probably pizza since they have great pizza there. That's, That's why great. You to go to the Rainbow to have Did pizza. you talk drumming or talk about the Who, or was it completely outside of music? Because I do that sometimes when I yeah. go to dinner with some of my favorite musicians. We won't even talk about music. I don't. Th- no, I'm. I'm pretty sure we didn't talk about music. I mean, I knew who the he, the Who, the Hugh, the Who were um, because of Tommy, and of course, growing up, you know, with sure. with the Who. But um, no, because I was probably way too intimidated. I was just a wee thing. Yeah. But you knew. Great. Pre-punk days too. Yeah, yeah that's so, right. Back yeah. then. Yeah. Yeah. But you knew the footprint that he had left on the music world, even at that age and at that time, right? Oh, absolutely. And I remember when he died, and and um, being really, really sad because it he he definitely left the impression on me that he just was being a total gentleman and and really nice and really super nice guy. Great. Well, thanks for sharing your Thank wonderful you. experience. It ties in with the show. <laughs> Belinda okay. Carlisle here on Drum Talk. TV. Thank <laughs> you. 
We're going to need a bigger mallet. Yeah.